Mes chers et chers collègues, mesdames et messieurs, je déclare cette deuxième séance de la Commission permanente ouverte. J'aimerais pour commencer vous faire part de quelques modalités pratiques. En ce qui concerne la discussion des rapports, le temps de parole est limité à trois minutes. Les rapporteurs des commissions saisies sur le fond disposent d'un total de dix minutes pour la présentation de leur rapport et pour la réplique aux interventions. Les rapporteurs pour avis ainsi que les présidentes et les présidents des commissions saisies pour le fond disposent de trois minutes. Le temps pour la présentation des amendements ou sous-amendements est limité à une minute. Je vous rappelle aussi que seuls les membres de la commission permanente sont autorisés à voter. Conformément au mémorandum sur les modalités du déroulement des réunions des commissions à distance, approuvé par le Bureau le 7 mai 2020, les propositions d'amendement à un projet de texte doivent être soumises par écrit au secrétariat au moins 48 heures avant la réunion, et un recueil des propositions d'amendements sera transmis aux membres par le secrétariat 24 heures avant la réunion. Nous en venons à présent à la discussion des deux rapports. Le premier rapport, « Les démocraties face à la pandémie de Covid-19 » de la Commission des questions politiques et de la démocratie, sera présenté par le rapporteur M. Yann Lidl-Granger. La commission de suivi a été saisie pour un avis qui sera présenté par Mme Yulia Lovoshkina, et le deuxième rapport, « Les conséquences de la pandémie de Covid-19 sur les droits de l'homme et l'état de droit » est présenté par la Commission des questions juridiques et des droits de l'homme. Il sera présenté par le rapporteur M. Vladimir Vardanian. La Commission de la culture, de la science, de l'éducation et des médias a été saisie pour un avis qui sera présenté par M. Boguslav Sonik. Je donne d'abord la parole à M. Yann Lidl-Granger, pour présenter le rapport de la Commission des questions politiques et de la démocratie. Monsieur Lidl-Granger, vous disposez d'un temps de parole total de 10 minutes. Yes, um, good morning. Oh, hang on. Okay, that should be better. Thank you very much indeed. Can I start off by thanking all my colleagues, and I'm delighted to be able to present this report on democracies facing the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'm very grateful was adopted unanimously by the Committee on Political and Democracy at its meeting on the 23rd of December. And I would also deeply like to thank the rapporteur for the opinion of the Monitoring Committee, Mrs. Lovienska, especially regarding her cooperation and her kindness over the amendments that were proposed by the committee. We began this work in March and had two very interesting hearings in the committee with the participants of the Parliamentary Assembly and experts from the Venice Commission, the UK Constitutional Unit and Chatham House. We also have bilateral contacts with Dr Nabarro, who is the World Trade Organization Special Envoy for COVID-19 and American Congressman. Dear colleagues, this pandemic has been the greatest public health crisis the world has faced in recent history. It has claimed over a million lives from across every continent and has produced unprecedented consequences for social, economic and political lives of our societies. It also had been a crash test for governance systems and institutions at national and at international level. Obviously, our assembly could not afford to stay idle in front of this unprecedented crisis. Several reports were initiated to cover aspects of the pandemic and its impact. The report, this report, is structured around three main themes. Democracy safeguards in emergency situations, including crisis management, democratic requirements, and the guiding principles relating to elections during emergency situations. Number two, national pan parliaments facing COVID-19, including the role of parliaments as guarantors of democracy in times of crisis, and an overview of various national experiences and good practice of parliaments adopting COVID-19 or adapting to COVID-19. And global challenges and the multilateral response to COVID-19 pandemic. May I start number one, which was the democratic safeguards. In view of the exceptional nature of the public health crisis, many governments enacted under times of constraint, a vary of immediate and extraordinary measures. They aimed at stopping delay or spreading the virus to any great extent. These measures have been significant impact on their people's lives. 
professional and social, and on the enjoyment and the fulfillment of rights, and on the functioning of and the balance between dem democratic institutions and process. In a statement made on the 25th of March 2020, Dame Cheryl Gillam warned that in times of crisis, parliamentary democracies cannot be put on hold. She called for parliamentary scrutiny of governments, even if exercised through new means, to be protected during the COVID-19 pandemic and in to ensure transparency in public debate to, prevers, to preserve citizens' trust in democratic institutions. Accordingly, in the resolution, we propose that we record a fundamental principle that must be respected by governments and public authorities at all levels when introducing emergency measures to cope with the pandemic, while supporting states and public authorities in giving priority to saving lives and protecting populations. We stress that dem democracy, human rights and rule of law cannot be allowed to become the collateral damage for a pandemic. No public health emergency may be used for as a pretext to destroy democratic acquisition. Emergency situations, especially when a state of emergency is formally declared, generally affect the system of checks and balances. This is a risk of abuse of emergency powers by governments to silence the opposition and restrict human rights. In this context, it is important to recall that all emergency measures introduced in response to the pandemic must be limited in duration and not exceed the duration of the emergency situation that warranted them. We further recall that parliaments must continue to play their triple role of representation, legislation and oversight. Oversight is even more essential in times of emergency, where the executive acquires additional powers. The continuity of parliament and the public coverage of its work during a public health emergency are also essential in the way that we allow all major political forces to be represented and to participate in democratic decision making. Above and beyond party cleavages, politicians must act with utmost responsibility to minimise the damage to the population, economy, social structure and public institutions, address the causes of the crisis and work in concert with post-pandemic recovery plans, which are also need to be prepared for future crises. Citizens' confidence in public authorities and democratic institutions and process is also essential at the times of crisis. In the draft resolution, we thus call upon member states to respect the system of democratic checks and balances. And we've set those out as a list of principles in paragraph seven. The pandemic has, distri distri has disrupted the normal course of electoral cycles in many countries. In some cases, elections have been postponed. In others, the organizations of elections have been given rise to controversy. Here too, we suggest a set of principles to be applied when deciding whether to hold or postpone elections during the situation of public health emergency and above all modulation. For holding elections during emergency situations based on recommendations by the Venice Commission. And may I at this stage, colleagues, refer to paragraph 10 of the draft resolution. We also suggest that we should envisage modulation to allow our assemblies to observe elections during an emergency situation. Chapter three of the report deals with the national parliaments facing COVID-19. It recalls the importance of parliaments as guarantors of democracy in times of crisis and offers an overview in response to parliaments of our member states, the pandemic. It is broadly based on the parliaments themselves. We welcome the fact that since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, most European members of uh, member states and parliaments have continued to exercise without interruption their statutory duties. They responded with flexibility and creativity, adopting their work to the extraordinary circumstances by implementing, to various degrees, a combination of measures. In the draft resolution, you can see those, which are carefully assessing the management of pandemics by governments, reviewing and, where necessary, revising legislation on emergency situations in a way that would ensure maximum efficiency while being fully compliant with the fundamental principle of democracy for human rights and the rule of law considering granting the opposition the right to chair relevant inquiries and to share experiences with good practice of pandemic management with their peers and parliaments during the multilateral parliament assemblies and the platforms and cooperation with international partners. We have tried at all these stages, I have said, to make sure that we do not in any way allow this to become the norm. But not at least in our last chapter, chapter four, the report deals with global challenges in this effect. On the global scale, the pandemic has aggravated some worriness amongst international nations 
and has received the shortcomings in the international health system that has shown in um, a resolution 2329 on lessons of the future from effective rights-based response to COVID-19, which was adopted in June. Governments and private firms are spending billions to create an effective vaccine by hopefully 21. Various candidates across more than a dozen countries are going, undergoing clinical trials. Exports have warned the bidding wars over vaccine will lead to inadequately and distribution and ultimately fail to eliminate the risk of new outbreaks. I do very much agree with the Secretary General of the UN on the need for a vaccine to be affordable and available to all people. For that to happen, states need to evidence-based international coordination and human rights compliance with a view of seeking a global focus on this. All Council of Europe member states should adopt a common European approach so that every one of the European's 850 million citizens can benefit from the equal protection of COVID-19. We must also support the World Trade Health Organization's independent and rigorous review of the international response to the pandemic, which started in the summer and is expected to live an interim report in November and a substantive one next May. The exercise will be critical. And let us not forget that the current Conflict-afflicted countries, or countries emerging from conflicts where pandemic has added another layer on top of the existing crisis. Our governments must positively respond to the UN Council and the course of the general and immediate cessation of all hostilities in all situations and the need for urgent unity and mutual support in battles against this terrible common enemy. Complacency and the lack of the word solidarity and leadership is vital in this. Declaration of the COVID-19, the Joint Alliance of Matrilateralism, signed by 24 countries, we're only as strong as the weakest link and building a more sustainable and resilient world through enhanced international cooperation is absolutely right. I do and strongly believe that all member states must be exemplary in this respect and the Council of Reserve to support our governments in this multilateral development. I always, as always, will try to incorporate as many people as I possibly can. And I hope we can adopt this report as we possibly can today. Thank you very much indeed. Merci, Monsieur Lidl Granger, pour votre intervention. J'invite maintenant Madame Lovoshkina à présenter l'avis de la commission de suivi. Vous avez trois minutes, Madame. Le micro peut être... Vous avez un problème de micro peut-être. Est-ce que vous avez appuyé sur le petit bouton en bas Peut-être que si vous enleviez vos écouteurs, ça irait mieux, Madame Lovoshkina. Ça fait peut-être un problème à ce niveau-là. Yeah, if you try to take off your headphones, it may help. Then you have to try to reconnect again to the meeting. Just disconnect and connect again using using Google Chrome.
Madame euh, Lovoshkina, on va essayer de résoudre le problème. En attendant, je vais donner la parole à Monsieur Vardanian pour présenter le rapport de la Commission des questions juridiques et des droits de l'homme. On reviendra vers vous tout à l'heure. Monsieur Vardanian, vous disposez d'un temps de parole de 10 minutes. À vous. Can you hear me? Oui, très bien. Yeah. Vous pouvez y aller. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madame President, dear colleagues. Europe has not experienced a year like 2020 in living memory. COVID-19 has killed hundreds of thousands of people across the uh, Council of Europe area. Millions of people have been infected with many of them feeling seriously ill. The disease continues to affect our daily life with the second wave growing in the most countries as I speak. All Council of uh, Europe member states have had take exceptional action in the spring, very few, if any of them, were fully prepared. On a global scale, there has been nothing like COVID-19 pandemic for many decades. But my report is not about public health, it's about core business of the Council of Europe. It's about whether member states responded to the public health crisis in a way that uh, respected basic standards of human rights. Uh, All Council of Europe member states are bound by the common legal framework based on the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which is an expression of ideals in the real world. It anticipates the possibility of emergencies and is as flexible as it needs to be in response. National authorities have given a margin of appreciation to take the necessary measures as long as the impact of Convention rights is proportionate. This is a complex, delicate exercise. My report didn't try to second guess whether national measures were proportionate or not. I had neither the time nor the resources for this. The Convention also requires emergency measures to be lawful, which means a clear and accessible basis in national law. This question is more straightforward. In several states, measures had to be taken in early stages that didn't have a clear legal basis. This was mainly because the pandemic was an ex unexpected and states were not fully prepared. Of course, saving lives was the first imperative, but there are now lessons to be learned. It is possible, even probable, that there will be more pandemics in the future. Member states must make sure now that their legal frameworks are reviewed and reformed as necessary. The Wendings Commission has produced valuable guidelines this year on how emergency measures can be compatible with the rule of law. All member states should refer to the standards when reviewing and reforming their emergency legislation. In the early weeks of this crisis, there was a lot of concerns about what it might mean for liberal democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Would authoritarian regimes and populist strongmen protect their citizens better than democracy could? It turns out that way not. Liberal democracies from East Asia and Australasia to Europe have brought the disease under control without sacrificing their fundamental values. So strong men have done no better, and some have done very much worse. And whilst China seems to have control of the disease, it was China's secrecy, paranoia, and repression that allowed the initial outbreak to spread. That's not to say that the response of the Council of Europe member states has been perfect. I have no doubt that Europe leaders, Europe's leaders have uh, been genuinely concerned for the health of their citizens. I'm sure that we have taken the steps that we thought necessary, but the unprecedented nature of this crisis made some mistakes inevitable. My report builds with the situation up to the end of June. It includes many examples from all across Europe of mistakes and inadequacies. It would be misleading and artificial not to acknowledge these realities. The report would have little value if it pretended that everything was fine. But you will see that my intention wasn't to blame or shame, but simply to illustrate some of the problems that have occurred. The aim now must be to correct the outstanding problems and ensure that they do not occur again in the future. In many cases, national authorities have already taken corrective actions, as noted in my report. Others have not yet done so, but all the member states should 
review their recent experience in the light of Council of Europe standards on human rights and the rule of law. The draft resolution tabled by the Legal Affairs Committee, however, doesn't mention any states. It deals rather with the matters of general principles that are equally applicable to all member states. With the disease still are around us, this is time for solidarity and consensus. The resolution contains a general description of the areas in which some of the most serious problems have arisen. These are emergency measures that were taken in response to pandemic, states of emergency, that is the exceptional legal regimes that many states introduced, derogation from the European Convention of Human Rights, which were introduced by 10 states. This is a huge number. We haven't seen uh, this before. Data protection, especially the relational contact tracing smartphone applications, the function of judiciary situation in prisons and other places of the probation of liberty, corruption in the public procurement and economic stimulus and recovery measures. This is followed as a reminder that of the most of important and accessible sources of information of the Council of Europe standards. The resolution affirms the assembly endorsement of these standards. There is also a draft recommendation, and draft recommendation is focuses on two issues, harmonizing national practice on derogations to the Convention and the pan-European review of recent experience, so that member states can learn from one another about what worked and what didn't work. These are key areas of business of Council of Europe, where the organization is addressing core issues and has real added value. Dear colleagues, when I finalized my report in June, many countries were starting to emerge from the lockdown and the numbers of cases were falling. Unfortunately, things are now heading in the opposite direction. Restrictions are again being imposed, but in this time, public tolerance may be lower, especially with the winter coming. It is vitally important that our population keep faith in their governments and respect the need for restrictions. This means that restrictive measures must be transparent, understandable, proportionate, and democratic. People must be convinced that the measures are based on the objective evidence and scientific reasons and are proportionate and non-discriminatory. All of this is possible within the standard model of democracy that the Council of Europe has developed and promoted over the case. The Legal Affairs Committee draft resolution and those of the other committees will remind member states and other actors how to achieve these goals. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I strongly recommend and encourage the standing committee to support this resolution. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Vardenian. Alors, est-ce qu'on va essayer de retrouver Madame Lovoshkina tout de suite, si elle est connectée, comme ça, elle pourra reprendre son rapport pour avis par rapport au rapport de Monsieur Lidengranger. Madame Lovoshkina, vous êtes connectée On l'a perdu, donc on va... Non, elle est... Très bien. On l'a perdu Dans ce cas, je vais passer la parole à M. Sonic pour présenter l'avis de la Commission de la culture, de la science, de l'éducation et des médias. M. Sonic, vous avez trois minutes. On réessaiera après avec Mme Lovoshkina. Je vous en prie. De toi. Allô Oui, oui, on vous oui. entend. Oui, oui, on vous Oui, parce que je ne vois pas. Je, je pas... Bon, tout d'abord, euh, j'aimerais féliciter le rapporteur, M. Vardanian, ainsi que la Commission de questions juridiques et de droits de, de l'homme, pour l'excellent rapport concernant l'impact de la pandémie de Covid-19 sur le droit de l'homme et l'état de droit. Notre commission partage pleinement les analyses et les conclusions de ce rapport. 
La crise sanitaire globale pose un défi sans précédent pour le droit de l'homme et l'état des droits, car dans ces situations d'urgence, le risque est grand et dépasser les limites de ce qui est nécessaire et justifié. Cependant, comme le souligne justement le rapport, même dans les, les situations d'urgence nationale, les États membres ne peuvent pas supprimer les libertés, demander, euh, démanteler la démocratie ou violer l'état des droits. Notre commission qui a été saisie pour avis a concentré son analyse sur la liberté d'expression, y compris la liberté des médias, des libertés qui ont souvent été mises à rude épreuve lors de cette crise. Le rapport fait valoir à juste titre que lors d'une pareille pandémie, l'information est essentielle et parfois vitale pour que le public soit averti des dangers. C'est pourquoi les mesures qui restreignent la liberté d'expression, l'accès à l'information, la liberté des médias sont difficilement justifiable. Or, paradoxalement, pendant la pandémie, les menaces contre la liberté des médias et la sécurité des journalistes se sont accentuées et multipliées, comme le confirme la plateforme du Conseil de l'Europe. De nombreuses attaques verbales et physiques contre des journalistes ont été dénoncées. Le risque de la désinformation a été utilisé comme prétexte pour museler les médias critiques par rapport à l'action du gouvernement. Les journalistes ont été arrêtés, souvent maltraités aussi, sous prétexte de non-respect de la quarantaine. Notre commission approuve pleinement le projet de résolution. Dans le même temps, en se fondant sur l'analyse développée dans notre rapport pour avis, elle suggère de renforcer la résolution en soulignant l'urgence pour nos États membres d'assumer pleinement euh, l'obligation de protéger la liberté des médias et la sécurité des journalistes. Notre commission propose des amendements qui, à notre avis, sont de nature à compléter le rapport en ce qui concerne l'impact de la pandémie sur la liberté des médias. Dans le paragraphe 3 du projet de résolution, avant le membre de phrases qui commence par le mot « les euh, journalistes, les teneurs dans l'air de les défenseurs des droits de l'homme », insérer la proposition suivante. Par conséquent, la pandémie de Covid-19 et d'autres crises similaires potentielles qui pourraient survenir à l'avenir ne devaient pas être considérées comme un prétexte pour l'adoption d'une législation d'urgence introduisant des restrictions à la liberté d'information qui vont au-delà de ce qui est légal, nécessaire, proportionné et non discriminatoire. Et amendement B, après la sous-paragraphe 12.1, 5 du projet de résolution insérer le dessous paragraphe suivant. 12.6. Remplir leur obligation positive de protéger la liberté des médias et la sécurité des journalistes en utilisant tous les moyens nécessaires pour mettre fin aux attaques physiques et verbales contre les professionnels des médias. Et 12.7. Mettre fin à la pratique du blocage des sites Internet et du déclenchement de poursuites pénales pour intimider de faire taire les critiques sous prétexte de lutter contre la désinformation. Merci. Merci, merci Monsieur Sonic. Alors, une dernière tentative pour Madame Lovoshkina pour son avis de la commission de suivi par rapport au premier rapport, celui de Monsieur Lidl Granger. Est-ce que vous êtes avec nous maintenant, Madame Lovoshkina Okay, can you hear me now? Yes? Finally, it's okay. I'm sorry for the technical issues. Uh, Madam President, dear colleagues, I would like to congratulate Mr. Jan Little Granger with his excellent report. I share his astute conclusions and especially his emphasis on the fact that under no circumstances a global health crisis should be allowed to undermine our fight for democratic quiz and the proper function of the democratic institutions. That conclusion touches upon the mandate of the monitoring committee. I have endeavored in this opinion to bring forward a number of additional observations in support of the overall late motive of this his report 
that is based on the experience of the monitoring committee. Firstly, when assessing how different member states have reacted to the global pandemic, it is essential to take into account the specific constitutional and legal order, as well as the democratic environment in each country. The committee has committed itself to assess the compliance of emergency measures with democratic standards in its regular monitoring and periodic review reports. Secondly, the COVID-19 pandemic caught many countries off guard. As a result, they were forced to adopt and implement specific measures at very short notice. In countries with more polarized political climates, this was marked by increased political tensions. Therefore, all member states should develop adequate constitutional and legal framework to deal with global health emergency situations. These measures should be based on a wide consensus between all stakeholders in order to ensure their wide public acceptance and they should do it now, before confronted by a new pandemic. In addition, in this opinion, I have made two observations with regard to the holding of democratic elections, which was an important topic of Mr. Little Grange's report. I fully shared the conclusion that parliamentary oversight and control are crucial in emergency situations. Moreover, it is essential that the legitimacy of the parliament and its functioning cannot be questioned under emergency. While I agree that the conduct of general elections under pandemic conditions is difficult, I am equally concerned about the democratic deficit that could result from a lengthy postponement of elections. Therefore, it is important that all member states ensure that an adequate legal framework is adopted provided for clear criteria for the postponement of election, as well as condition under which elections can be held in pandemic situations. And this should be based on a consensus, wide consensus, and agreed upon well before the next election are called upon. My second point about elections deals with election observation. Mr. Little Granger has rightfully highlighted the importance of election observation. At the same time, the assessment of election does not depend only on the observation of the ballot on election day. The Assembly has always used a more holistic approach to assessment of election. It equally considers the political environment, the long-term electoral preparation, and the legal framework for election. It is especially important to straighten this component of the assessment of elections. In my view, with new measures implemented in pandemic, such as increased use of postal voting, and internet working. Information obtained by the monitoring committee should be a crucial component of the holistic assessment. Such an approach also ensures that an assessment of an election by the assembly cannot be questioned, even when the physical observation of the vote on the election day is not possible due to pandemic conditions. This observation at the core of two amendments that the committee has tabled to the draft resolution of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy. And I'm grateful for the clearly expressed support of its rapporteur for these two additions to his already excellent text. Thank you for your attention and excuse for these technical problems. Merci. Du coup, vous avez eu un petit bonus, mais euh, nous sommes ravis aussi que vous ayez pu quand même intervenir. C'était important ce que vous aviez à dire. Je vous remercie tous les quatre. Le débat est maintenant ouvert. Qui souhaite prendre la parole Alors, je donne d'abord la parole aux représentants désignés par les groupes politiques. Je vais les nommer euh, tous les quatre de sorte qu'ils se mettent, euh, qui s'attendent à ouvrir et leur micro et, et leur vidéo. Donc, il s'agira de Madame Karamanli, de Monsieur Poitchek, de Monsieur Cotier et de Monsieur Gail. Donc, je donne d'abord la parole en premier à Madame Marietta Karamanli pour le groupe socialiste. Ah, elle n'est peut-être pas connectée. Vous l'avez Non Je vais. Si, c'est bon. Marietta Il faut. Il faut que vous demandiez la parole. Ouais, euh, 
Marietta Caramanli, il faut demander la parole et ensuite euh, appuyer sur la touche micro et sur la touche vidéo. Ça en fait beaucoup de choses, mais euh, voilà, <rire> c'est comme ça. Oh là là. Ça marche, oui. là. Oui, allô Est-ce que vous m'entendez Très bien. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui, oui. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Alors, Marietta, on t'entend, mais... Euh... Est-ce que vous m'entendez D'accord. <rire> C'est ce qu'on appelle un dialogue de sourds. <rire> oui, nous, oui. nous, on entend. Vous m'entendez Marietta Allô, allô Sinon, euh, je vais demander à... Est-ce que vous m'entendez ah, Oui, oui, oui. Marietta, est-ce que ça va Ou est-ce que euh, le temps qu'on prenne un autre orateur, peut-être Oui, on va prendre un autre orateur. Euh... Ah, très bien. Excusez-moi, parce que je, je n'arrive pas à, à vous entendre. Est-ce que, est que là, Marietta, c'est possible d'être de, de, oratrice ou pas du tout Ou est-ce qu'il vaut mieux qu'on prenne un autre orateur et ensuite tu reviens On va prendre M. Poitier pour euh, PPE. Oui, euh, merci, euh, merci infiniment. Euh, J'espère que vous m'entendez. Euh, chers collègues, la situation euh, qu'on a, euh, qu a vécue euh, il y a quelques secondes nous montre comment fragiles nous sommes parce que tout à coup, on peut nous couper la parole par des moyens techniques et on est éloigné, on ne peut pas réagir. Merci beaucoup pour euh, toutes les personnes qui ont contribué à créer ces rapports. Ce sont des rapports de qualité sur le sujet qui nous touche au fond, au cœur, nous tous. Ces deux rapports constituent les manuels pour nous tous, portant sur le sujet la démocratie dans les temps difficiles. Nous nous retrouvons dans le monde complètement différent du monde d'il y a à peine un an. À l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, nous avons la responsabilité approfondie pour veiller à ce que le temps difficile ne se solde par érosion des institutions démocratiques, défendre les libertés, le droit de l'homme, l'état de droit, c'est de résister aux pressions médiatiques ainsi que jugement euh, euh, par les réseaux sociaux qui souvent euh, sont, contournent les informations. Comment peut-on faire face à cette crise Quelles mesures à prendre pour regagner la confiance et la légitimité Sans doute, sans doute, nous ne pouvons pas cesser à veiller à ce que le pouvoir exécutif ne prenne pas des mesures qui contournent la démocratie. Et souvent, souvent, et ces rapports ce sont les témoignages. Souvent, c'est le cas. On a observé ça pendant euh, les élections, pendant euh, euh, huit derniers mois. Et euh, sans doute, sans doute, nous devons faire ici tout pour donner euh, la force 
à la démocratie aux gens qui sont un peu perdus et donner aussi l'aide la, à, 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 euh, à ces pays qui ont mal utilisé le temps de pandémie pour, pour euh, restreindre la démocratie. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Alexander. Euh, je donne la parole maintenant à M. Damien Cotier pour le groupe ALDE. Bonjour, merci, Madame la, la vice-présidente. Nous sommes dans un débat essentiel pour notre institution. La démocratie, l'état de droit, les droits de l'homme sont des biens parmi les plus précieux de l'humanité. Et en Europe, nous avons la chance de bénéficier d'institutions qui sont dédiées à leur défense et à leur promotion, en particulier évidemment le Conseil de l'Europe. Ces valeurs sont au cœur de ces institutions, comme vient de le dire joliment le représentant du, du PPE. Comme c'est la première fois que j'ai l'honneur de m'adresser à cette Assemblée, certes dans un format un peu particulier aujourd'hui, j'aimerais dans un mot personnel vous dire ma fierté au fond d'appartenir à cette institution. Au nom du groupe des libéraux et démocrates pour l'Europe, je tiens à féliciter et à remercier les rapporteurs pour leurs travaux, les travaux que nous soutenons. Je me limite ici à quelques remarques essentielles. Premièrement, si des limitations des droits fondamentaux sont justifiables pour préserver un bien aussi précieux que la santé, en situation exceptionnelle, il est juste de rappeler que ces exceptions doivent toujours être limitées dans leur durée, comme dans leur portée, et basées sur la loi. Deuxièmement, il est essentiel de maintenir le fonctionnement des contre-pouvoirs, même en temps de crise, et peut-être surtout en temps de crise. Les parlements doivent continuer à jouer leur rôle, et là, les parlements d'Europe ont été créatifs et flexibles pour pouvoir le faire. La justice doit, elle aussi, continuer à fonctionner pour assurer notamment le droit à un procès équitable. Troisièmement, les règles de la Commission de Venise sur l'état d'urgence, sur les états d'urgence, sont importantes et elles devront être davantage intégrées dans les législations nationales. Quatrièmement, la liberté d'expression, la liberté de la presse sont essentielles en tout temps et ni les crises ni la nécessité de lutter contre la désinformation ne doivent servir de prétexte pour les affaiblir. Cinquièmement, s'agissant du report d'élections, il faut des règles claires et des conditions strictes, un dialogue avec l'opposition et l'assurance d'un scrutin libre et équitable ainsi que la capacité de mener effectivement campagne. S'agissant de l'observation d'élections, une tâche importante de notre Assemblée, elle devra certainement être à nouveau réfléchie dans ce contexte qui évolue. Sixièmement, cette crise qui se moque des frontières souligne bien le besoin de coopérer davantage et mieux au plan multilatéral, à commencer par la diffusion des vaccins quand ils seront disponibles. Et septièmement, enfin, dans une perspective complémentaire à ce que je viens de dire, cette crise souligne aussi la nécessité de coopérer entre les autorités nationales, les autorités régionales et locales. Tous ces points et de nombreux autres qui sont évoqués dans les rapports devront faire l'objet de travaux de suivi, à la fois dans les États et dans notre Assemblée, comme le sont de cette crise du Covid-19. Le groupe ALDE remercie toutes les personnes et institutions du Conseil de l'Europe qui se sont engagées avec force pour défendre ces valeurs essentielles au fil de cette crise, à commencer par le président de notre Assemblée, la secrétaire générale, le comité des ministres et la commission de Venise. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous. Je donne la parole à Sir Roger Gale pour le groupe des conservateurs et de l'Alliance démocratique. Thank you, Madam. Uh, apologies for the slight delay in the technology. Um, on behalf of the European Conservative Group, can I congratulate Ian Little Granger and uh, Vladimir Vardanian and Yulia Avogenko for their work on these reports. Um, they are very important and they underscore, I think, the philosophy of the Council of Europe. It is absolutely the case that the pandemic, indeed any pandemic, cannot be allowed to interfere or corrupt the democratic process. The belief in democracy is the bedrock of the European Conservative Group, as of course it is the bedrock of the fundamental philosophy of the Council of Europe. Uh, we stand by that. Uh, we stand by our belief in the freedom of the press. And of course, the free press is instrumental in any democratic process and any democratic election. 
And I believe that the combined effort that's been put into these reports reflects all of those views. The European Conservative Group will most certainly be supporting the amendments proposed by the Monitoring Committee. Um, they contribute significantly to the report and improve it. It will surprise nobody probably to uh, know that we shall not be supporting the amendments tabled by the Russian Federation, which are a very thinly veiled attempt to undermine and dilute uh, the process of these reports. It, Russian Federation has never been particularly wedded, so far as I can see, to the democratic process, and uh, we will reject these amendments out of hand. But again, my thanks to all of those who put so much hard work into the preparation of these reports. We applaud it. Thank you very much indeed. Merci, Sir Gail. Je vais essayer de redonner la parole à Madame Karamanli pour le groupe euh, du, des socialistes. Bonjour. Bonjour, hein, Madame la Présidente, euh, mes chers collègues, excusez-moi pour les problèmes de connexion <rire> euh, ce matin. Euh, nous sommes effectivement, nous avons donc deux projets de résolution à examiner en, en vue de, de leur adoption par notre Assemblée. Et, et donc, au nom du groupe socialiste, je me félicite de, de la préoccupation forte et de la tonalité de ces deux projets selon lesquels la démocratie, les droits humains et, et l'état de droit ne peuvent, ne doivent devenir les dommages collatéraux de la pandémie. Et de nombreuses questions sont abordées et font l'objet de recommandations pertinentes. Pour ce qui est donc des droits de l'homme et de l'état de droit, le projet de résolution met en évidence euh, effectivement la, la question, euh, je dirais, de, euh, de la nécessaire vigilance et que les parlements et que notre Assemblée doivent avoir pour que les mesures de limitation des libertés soient interprétées de façon restrictive. Et les limitations doivent être nécessaires, limitées dans leur objet et dans leur durée, et en mots être donc proportionnées à l'objectif poursuivi. Parallèlement, le projet s'intéresse aux objets technologiques que la crise met en avant, que ce soit les applications pour téléphone, mobile, de, de détection des porteurs et malades possibles, ou que ce soit le recours à l'intelligence artificielle pour identifier patients, personnes et populations fragiles et à risque. Donc, euh, notre analyse est qu'un nos systèmes techniques n'est par nature euh, neutre et n'importe pas n'emporte pas les de, de risques. En tout état donc, donc de cause, ceux-ci doivent rester inférieurs aux bénéfices escomptés. Donc il n'y a pas d'un côté un dispositif technologique et de l'autre côté un usage déconnecté des besoins. C'est l'usage social qui doit être apprécié à l'aune des libertés et la réponse ne peut qu'être collective. Il nous faut donc euh, réglementer les nouvelles technologies, veiller à lutter contre les discriminations et les erreurs de l'IA, protéger les données personnelles. S'agissant donc des démocraties face à la pandémie, le projet évoque aussi la tenue des élections, le contrôle parlementaire et les bonnes pratiques des démocraties parlementaires ou encore la place et le rôle de la presse. Déjà touchée par l'évolution de, de son modèle économique et fragilisé par la crise, la presse aujourd'hui souffre à bien des égards d'une insuffisance d'indépendance. Il conviendrait donc d'encourager des médias indépendants, des actionnaires extérieurs, des annonceurs et des pouvoirs publics en leur donnant un cadre juridique innovant pour garantir la liberté en général et la liberté en temps de crise. L'enjeu est en effet donc de taille et c'est de cette liberté que dépend la diversité des points de vue, non seulement politiques et sociaux, mais aussi scientifico-techniques. Et on l'a vu à bien des égards, l'approche par le pouvoir politique et des mesures à prendre a tenu et tient à la qualité des données qui doivent être soumises aux mêmes conditions de recueil d'expertise et de commentaires. Donc trop souvent, euh, le pouvoir scientifique et expert sollicité pour dire ce qu'il sait répond de façon parfois presque inconsciente en disant ce qu'il préfère. Mais là encore, la méthode démocratique qu'empruntent nos, nos diverses sociétés nationales doit être privilégiée. Il faut promouvoir partout et tout le temps la collégialité des décisions le principe du contradictoire, la transparence des méthodes. Donc il ne faut pas considérer que cela est de tout temps acquis et à cela aussi notre Assemblée doit travailler. Voilà, euh, Madame la Présidente, mes chers collègues, mon intervention va s'arrêter là parce que euh, le temps est, est vraiment compté et c'est à partir de, je pense que c'est à partir de ce point 
que doivent désormais commencer nos réflexions pour un monde certes incertain, mais, pour le, mais, mais par l'objet en tout cas libre. Et je vous remercie vraiment de votre attention et des travaux des deux, de, deux rapporteurs sur ces, ces beaux projets. Et, et finalement, à nous de poursuivre ce travail parce que nous n'avons pas fini avec les crises qui vont venir devant nous. Merci. Merci, Marietta. Euh, il y a un dernier représentant euh, des deux partis, celui du parti euh, GUE, c'est M. Tini Cox, euh, que j'invite euh, à prendre la parole. Bonjour, Madame la Présidente. Très bien de vous voir là, dans le in chair à in Strasbourg. Uh, may I, on behalf of the group of Unified European Left, congratulate both rapporteurs Ian Lerner Granger and Vladimir Vardanian um, for the reports, the resolutions and recommendations that they have drafted together with the Political Affairs Committee and the Legal Affairs Committee on how to protect um, democracy, uh, human rights and the rule of law in times of crisis, a crisis which is now uh, 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 created by the, the COVID-19 virus. But may I recall, colleagues, that we, um, only a few years ago, we had another crisis in, in Europe that was the crisis of um, uh, the terrorism uh, that threatened so many of our, our member states. Then we also were in a crisis and we uh, then already had to answer the questions how to protect our fundamental values of uh, the Council of Europe uh, in times of, uh, of, uh, of crisis. Uh, we managed to do so. I had the honor then to draft a report on um, uh, combating terrorism while upholding a Council of Europe uh, uh, values and standards, a report that was adopted with large majority. And I think the same we will see today that the reports that have been drafted by Little Granger and uh, Vardanian will be um, uh, um, uh, accepted by uh, the the, the vast majority of our assembly. And I think that is important. It's important to see today that a, a rapporteur from, from the European Conservatives and a rapporteur from the EPP get full support of uh, the group of Unified European Left uh, in, in, in this, uh, this respect. Because as we are parliamentarians, we all have to stand strong now in these times of crisis for upholding democracy, human rights, and uh, and the rule of law. We have seen, Madam uh, President, uh, too many, far too many governments taking too many powers away from parliaments uh, uh, during this uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis. And we have seen far too many derogations from the European Convention of Human Rights. I think it's our, uh, our obligation as parliamentarians to uh, stand strong for uh, parliamentarism and for the rights of our parliaments in these times of, uh, of crisis. Therefore, I think it's important that after we have adopted these reports, we will stay vigilant and alert to see how things are developing in our 47 uh, member states of the Council of Europe. Uh, in times of crisis, that is my final uh, uh, word, Madam President, in times of crisis, we do not need less democracy, we need more democracy. If that is the spirit in which this debate can take place and uh, come to an end, then again, I congratulate both rapporteurs with their excellent reports. Thank you very much. Merci, Tini. On va continuer. J'ai encore six orateurs. Donc, je vais commencer avec Madame Sustar de Slovénie, s'il vous plaît. Hello. Hello, everyone. I would also like to congratulate you for the work you did. Uh, my debate is about the report of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights and the rule of law. As I have already stressed in the committee discussion, some facts in the Committee on Legal Affairs report, as well as in the Committee on Culture, opinion are false. Here I refer explicitly to paragraph 8, of Mr. Vardanian's report and paragraphs 25 and 31 of Mr. Sonic's report, in which Slovenia is mentioned in a negative context. However, I feel myself obligated to point out that the resolution and the recommendation 
as such, if I read alone, without knowing the background, in example, the report and the opinion would, in principle, be acceptable. I must also emphasize, once again, that paragraph 31 of the report prepared by Mr. Sonic is not true, as the facts listed are simply wrong. There was no such an attack from our Prime Minister as described in the opinion. The tweet mentioned in the opinion was written by someone else and the crisis headquarters only retweeted it, not the Prime Minister or his office. When journalists researched what happened, it was said that someone hacked into their account and retweeted inappropriate tweets. After this incident, there were no other incidents connected to that prof uh, Twitter profile. In my opinion, there is no need that this case is mentioned in the committee opinion, at least not in the present forum, as it is clearly, clearly untrue and thus only serves as a provocation against the government gov current government in Slovenia. As such, it's, it is misleading. Knowing all facts, it's uh, it is utterly inappropriate to compare the situation in Slovenia with Turkey or the R Russian Federation, as indicated by Mr. Sonic. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame. Euh, je profite de l'occasion d'avoir le micro pour dire que ceux qui souhaitent prendre la parole peuvent encore s'inscrire. Il n'y a pas de souci. Euh, ce n'est pas clos. Euh, je donne maintenant la parole à Madame Lapsimenko de Slovénie également. Dear sir, Madame, I would like to respond to some facts stated about Slovenia in the report of Legal Affairs Committee and particularly in the opinion of the Committee on Culture. I would like to point out that the statement in paragraph 31 of the committee's opinion is untrue. The Prime Minister didn't write the reported tweet. The mentioned tweet was written by someone else and the government crisis headquarters retweeted it. Anyway, the retweeting doesn't imply the agreement. Furthermore, I would like to point out that uh, paragraph 25 of the committee's opinion places Slovenia alongside Russia and Turkey in terms of treats and pressure on journalists, which, with which I really cannot agree. There is no pressure on journalists from political authorities in Slovenia, and the authorities cannot be held accountable for pressures from individuals who do not agree with the journalist report. In Slovenia, the media and journalists have complete media freedom. Maybe I should mention here that Slovenian media enjoyed the most freedom at the time of Janes Janša first government between 2004 and 2008, when Slovenia ranked ninth and 10th place. So it might make more sense to wait until the end of the term of the current government and then judge how the international public sees press freedom in our country. Regarding commodity reserves and the contracts signed for protective equipment, which was also mentioned in the report, I need to add that there was no whistleblower at the Agency for Commodity Reserve as reported, but merely a repender pointing the finger at others only to disguise his own signature under contracts worth hundreds of millions that should never have been signed. In the background of his disclosures, is only a political agenda. I would also like to draw attention to the specifics of the Slovenian media landscape. Although some media find it difficult to admit this, they historically originate from a left wheel political option. So they continue to highlight the agendas of left-wing parties. Anyone who follows them at least a little knows how much they support the left-wing governments and how negative is their attitude towards the right-wing government, the government led by Janis Janša. At the end, I need to point out that sources for information on Slovenia provided in this report, like Ostro, are not independent and not objective at all. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Madame. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Howell du Royaume-Uni.
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam President. First of all, allow me to give my congratulations to the rapporteurs for, for this excellent, uh, excellent series of reports. Um, and, and I mean that very, very sincerely. I think this is a crucial moment, actually, in the, in the functioning of the Council of Europe. I, I think it's a crucial moment to make sure that our, uh, our aims and objectives are well understood and well uh, put into play. For me, the rule of law, democracy and human rights are not academic concepts. They are real concepts that we need to actually see and to, and to work uh, in our own countries. And if I have one criticism of, of the report, it is in, in the efforts that, that are going to be made to try to make sure that this, these reports are, are implemented in the countries of, uh, or, or that, that are members of, of the Council of Europe. Uh, and, and I think that that is a duty that, uh, that falls on all of us to be able to, to take that forward. I think it's very important that we approach this not from a blame and shame uh, perspective. It's very important that we not try to single out countries that have done things wrong or have not approached uh, the situation in, in the right way. The important point that we need to make here is about sharing information. It's about making sure that people understand what the, what the rules are, how they can make sure that the rule of law, democracy and human rights are at the centre. And one of the key elements of that is in convincing their populations that what they are doing is right and taking them with them. And, and for example, in, in the UK this afternoon, we have a, a large debate on, uh, on, on the proposals that the Prime Minister uh, here ha has made in, in order to uh, provide some focus on, on the tackling of, 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 the, of the next stage of, of COVID. Now, I'm completely uh, at one uh, with, uh, with, with Sir Roger Gale and others about the free press. But where I, where I would draw a line is in social media. If you look at social media today, you will see that it, it, it goes between the pandemic being over to the pandemic being um, about to, dis to destroy humanity. And I do think there needs to be some control uh, exercised over social media, if that is possible, in order to make sure uh, that, that we get uh, an, accurate, an accurate picture. But as I say, I think that the, the, the I'd, I'd like to congratulate again the rapporteurs uh, for their excellent um, uh, pr productions uh, to, today, and to and, and to ask all of us to make sure that their recommendations are fully implemented in our own countries. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Ovel. Uh, je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Sigmund de Hongrie. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, I would like to congratulate to the rapporteurs to the report, uh, especially to the report of uh, Mr. Lydell uh, uh, Granger. However, I would like to have uh, some comments uh, to the exploratory memorandum of the report of uh, Mr. Vladimir Vardanian and also to the report of the uh, Committee of Culture and Science. Uh, uh, in the first report of Mr. Lydell Granger, it's correctly stated uh, the situation in Hungary, and it's, uh, it's referred to the letter uh, sent by Mr. Zsolt Német, our head of delegation, in which he elaborates exactly what does it mean, the uh, situation, the legal situation, the, the legal framework in Hungary, how we understand uh, the legal framework of the state of emergency, and he's stating in his letter that the Parliament of Hungary was working permanently. Uh, personally, we were taking part at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the at the forums, and the state of emergency ended on the 16th of June, uh, when, the, when we, the Parliament, uh, voted the end of the state of emergency. However, in the expert memorandum of the report of Mr. Vardadian, he still referred to the state of emergency uh, without uh, the comments of uh, Mr. Nement, and it's, he's also stating that uh, uh, it's a very unique uh, situation what uh, was in Hungary, a very different approach he's, uh, he's stating. I, I want, would like to argue that every state is uh, uh, taking a different approach uh, according to the legal system of that state. And also in the report of the Committee of Culture, uh, Mr. Sonik uh, uh, is a, 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 
elaborating a political opinion stating that uh, the government of Hungary wants to use the, this situation to silence all critics by threatening independent journalists with criminal prosecution. And these kind of terms, I would like to argue that we do not need the political terms. We, we should uh, remain uh, within the legal terms. And uh, this excellent report, uh, 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 which I uh, have referred to, uh, really uh, entering in the deep analysis of the legal system as throughout analysis. And we also have the Venice Commission documents, uh, which are very interesting and very important legal documents because we face a very delicate legal question. And we, we have to realize that every state has a special legal system. You have states when you don't have a constitu uh, constitutional courts, so you have different uh, approaches. And I would like to, st uh, to stress that the fundamental uh, law in Hungary is those rights which cannot be subject to further limitation, even, uh, even special legal order. And also I would like to, uh, to, to emphasize that crisis management measures adopted in Hungary are fully in line with the principle of rule of law and the safeguard of human rights. And we do agree with some previous speakers uh, were telling that we, we do need more democracy and we have to fight uh, against this COVID pandemic, also with legal terms, and we have to rely on each other and we have to, uh, if we uh, analyze uh, one state's legal system, then we have to refer to the legal terms. And uh, as uh, um, lawyers, uh, we don't have to formulate political opinions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Sigmund. And now it's uh, Mr. Baskin. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. Разрешите и мне. Меня слышно, да? Позвольте и мне поблагодарить докладчиков. Важно и символично, что оба эти доклада прозвучали одновременно. Оба доклада близко пересекаются и отвечают на общие вопросы. И точно помогут европейцам лучше реагировать на опасный вирус. Мне даже кажется, что после опубликования этих докладов заболеваясь в Европе и в мире пойдет на снижение. Но если говорить серьезно, то ситуация показывает, что перед лицом общей опасности все страны способны объединиться и действовать сообща. Сегодняшняя дискуссия тому подтверждение. Именно поэтому выглядит странной попытка одного из выступающих использовать даже такую универсальную тему для дополнительного нападения на Российскую Федерацию. Нам нужно уметь подниматься над своими личными политическими предпочтениями, а сейчас работать вместе для благополучия, благополучия всех европейских народов. Наши граждане равны и одинаковы, и, к сожалению, даже болеют они одинаково. Надеюсь, что остальные коллеги это хорошо понимают и спокойно к этому относятся. Поддерживаю большинство выступающих. Противоэпидемические меры — это всегда и в первую очередь ограничения в передвижениях по стране и по миру. Это ограничения по собраниям, много других рестрикций. Необходимо уметь соблюдать золотую середину и не скатываться в другую крайность, в чрезмерное по силе и по продолжительности действия ограничений. И вот здесь особую роль играют два столпа демократии в Европе. Это парламенты и это средства массовой информации. Роль парламентов во время эпидемии никак не должна снижаться. Она даже еще более ответственна. И в первую очередь в виде законотворчества. Быстрые изменения эпидемической ситуации, необходимость спасать экономику, обеспечивать тонкую настройку санитарных мер, вынуждает парламенты даже в такие напряженные дни с риском для своего здоровья, но собираться и решать вопросы во имя благополучия своего населения. Я не буду долго говорить и занимать время, я вижу, будут выступать еще мои коллеги. И еще раз позвольте поблагодарить докладчиков за эти важные сообщения. Спасибо. Oh. Good morning, although I'm, I'm hardly seen. Um, my congratulations to the rapporteurs for, because they have uh, rightly focused on the challenge we face as democratic societies. Is uh, what uh, is in the issue is the depth of uh, the democracy, which uh, always is proved in the time of crisis. This crisis has to be considered as a major one and uh, has uh, analogies with the crisis of the 
mid 30s uh, in Europe. So having said that, um, and with the pandemic far from over, we need to be vigilant now more than ever so that the situation does not get out of hand. We also need to prioritize our actions and allocate sufficient resources so as to implement these measures. Concerning implications for justice and the rule of law, we, we must ensure that emergency restrictions are anchored in the rule of law. The digital transition of the judicial sector must also be pursued and completed. We must also safeguard judicial independence and transparency in all member states. It is necessary that parliaments maintain and strengthen their role as guarantors of stability and democratic legitimacy. I think that the main point and issue is that no ministerial decree must substitute or can substitute the legislative. The problem on the issue lies, and the, I finish with that, with the disguised restrictions and interventions to human rights and political rights. This is our main concern. Through the pretext, the pretext of uh, the pandemic, we cannot allow any intervention beyond the demo what democratic society standards uh, uh, request, so as to be, let be rigid and vigilant on that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Estacio. Now is Mr. Maysay from the UK. And thank you, Mr. President. Um, I congratulate the rapporteurs on two extremely thorough and interesting reports. They raise issues which all of us have struggled with in the course of COVID-19 which would indeed be applicable to other pandemics. I will focus on the report on human rights and the rule of law. But the report laboratory raises issues such as the need to balance individual rights with public interest and the importance of keeping measures under review. He also rightly states that the measures must be lawful, necessary, proportionate and non-discriminatory. He suggests that the Committee of Ministers should give terms of reference to appropriate intergovernmental committee or committees. All this makes sense. I think some of us will have felt as if we are in free fall with this situation. In the UK, there are complaints that instructions from government are confusing and inconsistent, even not to be trusted, for example, with contact tracing apps. There are reports of serious mental health de de deterioration in all the ages. We have peaks of COVID in geographical areas which have long suffered from de deprivation and from inequality in health which I know exists in all countries. I want to illustrate some of the complexity of the situation with regard to children and young people. I've been appointed rapporteur by the Social Affairs Committee on the subject of the impact of COVID on children's rights. I'm aware that some countries have closed schools. Here's a measure which could have serious long-term effects, especially on vulnerable children. The risk of falling behind in education not being able to socialise, not having a routine, not having access through school to children's services could be devastating, with serious impacts on mental health. Some families don't have access to facilities, such as into the internet for homeschooling. Child poverty has increased, domestic violence has increased, commissions for children across Europe, working to continue to uphold children's rights in the context of emergency situations, point out this emergency situation has made a visible and systematic failure to take into account children's rights and well-being in some countries. COVID-19 has highlighted existing deficiencies in many systems, including those for children. How we deal with those systems is an enormous problem, especially in times of economic hardship. I welcome these reports, which suggest ways forward, as well as providing a comprehensive review of the challenges. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And now is uh, Mr. Ramos from Portugal.
Oui, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je souhaite saluer les rapports de la Commission des questions politiques et des commissions juridiques présentées aujourd'hui. Bien longtemps, focus, le temps que nous entrons malheureusement dans la deuxième vague de l'épidémie de la COVID-19. Le 26 juin 2020, notre Assemblée a déjà adopté une les droits à la pandémie de COVID-19. Permettez-moi de rappeler les grandes lignes. Nous devons agir vite pour endiguer toute résurgence en prenant des mesures efficaces, testées et éprouvées, mises en œuvre dans les respects des droits. Nous devons réaffirmer le rôle fondamental des parlements et nous devons nous assurer qu'ils ont en capacité d'exercer pleinement leur mission. Nous devons permettre à l'OMS de mieux s'acquitter de son mandat qui est d'attendre euh, le, euh, le meilleur niveau de santé possible pour tous et toutes par une réforme d'organisation qui permet à l'OMS de ne pas dépendre des contributions volontaires pour remplir ses fonctions essentielles et qui renforce le règlement sanitaire international en vue de redéfinir la gouvernance mondiale pour lutter contre les maladies, mais qui met aussi en place un contrôle efficace et indépendant, idéalement parlementaire de l'organisation. Si nous arrivons à mettre en œuvre leurs recommandations l'Assemblée a adopté aujourd'hui et en juin 2020, nous avons une chance d'éviter une catastrophe en termes de perte per humaine, de l'ordre de la maladie, ainsi que des conséquences aussi catastrophiques pour l'économie et les droits humains. Merci bien. Merci, M. Ramos. Maintenant, c'est M. Steinen, de les Netherlands. Yes, good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm going back to the floor. Good morning, everybody. I would like to compliment both rapporteurs uh, to excellent, for their excellent reports. As they say, human rights, democracy, and rule of law are not a luxury for good times. They're absolutely a necessity for turbulent and difficult times. And this is what we're facing today and tomorrow and maybe next year. I was particularly impressed by the chapter on elections during emergency situations and the guiding principles in the report on democracy. But I have a specific question. What does this mean for the work of PACE when it comes to election observations? How do we deal with the travel restrictions some of us have been uh, faced with by our own governments? Uh, and how do we actually implement the paragraph 11 of the draft resolution on um, ensuring that we can still maintain our role, our duty in election observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's uh, Mr. Altun Yaldas from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would like to express my thoughts on the report of uh, Robert and Mr. Vardanyan about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights and the rule of law. There has been some sort of view on the report uh, that is not uh, uh, true for Turkey and, and that is not uh, compatible with what we have done uh, during the pandemic as Turkey. Let me just uh, reiterate. Uh, we would all agree that COVID-19 is one of the greatest challenges that the humanity has been trying to overcome. And this disaster has already been in various fields without exception. As the effects of the pandemic have paralyzed a number of sectors in the economy, It has also threatened not only the quality of the life, but also even the animals that could, have, that could not be spared from this pandemic. In order to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, although any state of emergency has not been declared, Turkey has adopted to pursue its efforts by ad adopting necessary measures in line with its legal framework in this context. 
I would like to underline that Turkey has adopted human rights oriented policies. We have always strived to protect the rights of our, of our, our citizens and refugees present in our country without any discrimination. All our institutions and facilities are mobilized for this purpose. First and foremost, for the protection of the right to life. And it's also obvious that Turkey is one of the one of the countries that are on the top of the list, which are aware of the needs and fragility of vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. And Turkey is also aware of the utmost importance of the protection of the rights of the women, children, family, elderly, people with disabilities, especially during the such extreme term. And besides those deprived of their liberty represent another vulnerable group. For this reason, our government introduced improvement on execution of penal sentences. And I would like to emphasize that a large number of persons meeting the requirements specified in the law were released with this regulation, and this regulation also increases health measures that should be applied within penitentiary institutions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Last but not least, Mr. Chair, Turkey has believed that COVID-19 is a disaster all of the states that should coordinate and collaborate in order, to, in our, in order to, uh, to fight with it effectively. Only this global solidarity and international cooperation could be successful to overcome COVID-19. At this regard, our country, while taking the necessary steps to protect public health, also extends a helping hand to other countries as well. In line with this understanding, medical emergency assistance has been delivered to more than 100 countries. Hence, I wish all of these of, uh, of our country should be assessed fairly and both cooperative and inclusive way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yaldiz. And then this, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez from Spain. Mrs. Gonzalez, can you hear me? Mrs. Marta Gonzalez? Mrs. Marta Gonzalez, can you hear me? Okay. It sounds that Mrs. Marta Gonzalez cannot hear us. Okay. Does anyone else wish to take the floor? Speaker list is closed. Then I call Mr. Dendel Granger to respond, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Oh, hang on. Sorry, damn technology. Um, Mr. President, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating listening to people and their concerns. One or two just observations. Mr. Bushkin from Russia, I only got part of his um, because unfortunately translation failed. Mrs. Stenner from the Netherlands, very good point. I would just say that um, we are looking at the observations of elections and this needs to be work that's still to be underdone, taken. There is more to be done and it needs to be in partnership with the Bureau and with the outs other outside Venice Commission, OECD and others. 
this is a piece of work we weren't asked to do, but I take the point on board from Mrs. Stenner. All my other colleagues put in some very good and sensible ideas with great thoughts, and I'm very grateful for people and their thinking on this. This report, of course, if, you, if colleagues would just bear with me, is, is still evolving. We are still in the middle of the pandemic. It is still not resolved. Um, we need to continue doing work on this because the lessons we're learning and the points that are coming through from colleagues need to be incorporated. I, I would like to think that we as colleagues put this on a shelf and whenever this happens again, which it will, we can take this off and it will be there for our, the people to follow us to say, yes, this is what happened in 2020, 21, and therefore we have something to work on. But I am incredibly grateful and can I just thank the staff and everybody who have played an enormous role in this. It has been very complicated and it's been going on a long time. And to all my colleagues for their patience in while we put this together. Mr. President, can I um, thank you, sir, and, and obviously colleagues at PACE. Thank you so much. Does the chairperson of the Committee of Political Affairs and Democracy wish to take the floor? Then Gillian, you will have the floor for three minutes. Thank you, President. First of all, can I thank um, both our own rapporteur on the Political Affairs Committee um, and also Mr Vardanyan uh, for two excellent reports. And can I also thank the Secretariat to our committee, um, particularly Despina leading um, the team and also Pavel and Sylvia. They have been working really hard. Um, following my statement on the 25th of March, when I warned that in times of crisis, parliamentary democracy cannot be put on hold, I launched an internal consultation among members of the committee, asking for their ideas and information. And I want to thank all 16 colleagues that replied um, and uh, and we had their input, very valuable. And in order to get a better insight into the various responses taken by parliaments of our member states, we sent a questionnaire to national parliaments via the European Centre of Parliamentary Research and Documentation. And I'm very pleased to report that 37 parliaments replied, and I am very, very grateful for that. I also want to thank the Venice Commission, which, who contributed to our work, um, particularly with its new observatory on the situations of emergency and also the participation of the experts in our hearings. The pandemic is ongoing and there are consequences for all our lives and societies and follow-up is therefore necessary. The draft recommendation invites the Committee of Ministers to build on national experiences and good practice in responding to the pandemic and to develop checklists of parameters to help member states enable the fullest democratic participation possible in these emergency situations. Um, that work will be carried out by the Venice Commission and will help inform uh, future work of the Council of Europe. We also invite the Committee of Ministers to prepare guidelines on multi-level governance and response to emergencies, um, particularly noting that cooperation, coordination and exchange of information and good practice between the different tiers of government um, has proved crucial for the efficiency um, of member states' responses to the pandemic. Um, for our part, as a political affairs committee, we plan to continue studying the impact of the crisis, um, and, but also to try and prepare for any future ones. Uh, we need to look at the pillars of the democratic system, and in particular the functioning of parliament and the conduct of elections uh, in situations of emergency. But I would venture that we need to look even further forward. This is just work in progress, um, and we need to produce as a council more reports. I'm. I'm heartened by the linked reports and the four that we'll be looking at today, including this one. But we need to look very carefully at how our democracies are communicating with citizens, what the role of unelected actors, such as scientists and medical advisors, and even pharmaceutical companies and researchers in developing vaccines. We perhaps need to look at the peacetime use of military support by democracies when the war is against a, an unseen enemy that we are all facing. And uh, we must look also at the suspension of uh, manifesto commitments by governments and how that affects the governance of the countries. I would 
echo um, some of our speakers' requests to make sure that our reports are distributed widely uh, and possibly more efficiently than ever before amongst not only our member states but a wider audience. Um, we must ensure that we are the guardians of democracy. And uh, this report in congratulating Ian Little Granger is a great contribution towards that. Thank you for everyone involved. Thank you very much. Now I call Mr. Vadanyan to respond. Can you please use the microphone? Can't hear you. Now it's better? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. First of all, let me express the words of gratitude to all the, the contributors of this discussion uh, for the very warm words and for uh, the report. Uh, I would like also to uh, congratulate all the other reporters for preparing the excellent reports. I would like just to uh, address some uh, ideas which was discussed during this uh, conversation. First of all, uh, we actually tried to prepare our report within the mandate of the committee. That's why some issues are not uh, very widely discussed in the report. Uh, we, based on the very basic idea, very simple idea, uh, that the rule of law during the situation of emergencies is not in a sick leave. And the sunset clauses should be implemented as soon as it will be possible. I would like just to uh, address the issue concerning the using of new technologies. This was a, one of the challenging issues in our report, and we try to do our best to contact with the uh, Convention 108 Committee and try to get the guidelines how to react in this situation. I would like just to say that every state tried to use uh, more or less such kind of applications, but not in all the cases we face the uh, relevant results. Uh, some of the contributors of this discussion mentioned that we always face the crises. Some years ago, we have a crisis concerning with terrorism. Now we have a pandemic. It's quite even dangerous when you have terroristic activities in the period of pandemic. And we should work together on this issue, I think. Uh, I'm, it's, uh, it's very pity to listen to some uh, critics from the countries uh, which are mentioned. By the way, I would like just to say that my country is also mentioned there because, uh, frankly speaking, nobody was perfect. And we just mentioned this in the review, but in the uh, report, but, uh, nobody has any intention to shame or blame any country. That's why in the resolution you will find no reference to any country on this issue. I would like just to address the social media, actually uh, some uh, discussions in the mass media related to the whether or not the uh, posts in Facebook or in the, uh, the news such as there is no pandemic at all, this is false, should be limited. But we came to the conclusion that it's uh, on the age of the freedom of expression and uh, this would somehow create additional problems with the perspective of protection of rule of law and, uh, and the freedoms. The best option is to keep the information as free as it is possible and in this way to uh, fight against this. I would like just to address my Hungarian colleague, I would like just to say that first, uh, we addressed in a report uh, to the issues which covered the period until the mid-June. That's why some information might be outdated. I understood perfectly well that uh, each country tried to use its own system of protection for uh, own population, but I would like just to say that we uh, concentrated on the measures, we concentrated on the issues which are uh, which may be uh, useful for the other countries to uh, address. Uh, I would like just to uh, say that uh, for sure parliaments shouldn't be substituted in the case of emergencies in any case. Constitutional courts are very important, but simultaneously they are. Uh, this is a long-term procedure and parliamentary oversights to over the activities of the government during the pandemics are very important. I would like just to address also the children's rights. It's the most complicated issue, believe me, and we don't 
do not penetrate in this issue, taking into account that this is rather the issue for the uh, Commission of Equality. But uh, we understood how uh, complex this issue is, and the state should be very uh, precise in a regulation in regulating these issues. Like also mentioned that uh, uh, addressing my Turkish counterpart, the Turkish counterpart, that the, there was no state of emergency in Turkey. I would like just to say that we uh, we do not concentrate on the issue whether there is official state of emergency or not. We concentrated on the issue whether measures undertaken by the countries are corresponding to the ideas of rule of law and basic standards of Council of Europe. I would like once again to uh, thank you all of you and especially the Secretariat of the Committee for assisting me in preparation of this report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vardanyan. Does the chairperson of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy wish to take the floor? Legal, legal affairs. Legal affairs. Sorry, Mr. Silovic, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Vardanyan for his very qualitative and serious work and his contribution into preparing uh, this important report. Uh, indeed, needless to say, it is hardly possible to effectively combat the pandemic with only legal means. But uh, without an adequate legal framework, which ensures uh, the safeguarding of the human rights and democratic principles, any effective measures against COVID are certainly not possible. I would like to express also my gratitude to other uh, bodies and institutions of the Council of Europe, and uh, uh, in particular to the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, the Venice Commission and CEPEJ, and uh, other people who contributed into this report through online consultations. And of course, uh, I would like to thank uh, our secretariat of the committee. Uh, so we, as Mr. Vardanyan said, we also have to face a crisis of uh, different types, uh, but uh, this is always a challenge. And this is also a test for our organization. And I believe that the reports we heard today and including also the report on behalf of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights, it is an important contribution into uh, handling uh, this pandemic effectively. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. The debate is closed. There will be a vote on the amendments to the first draft resolution. The Committee on Political on legal affairs and democracy has presented a draft resolution to which four amendments have been tabled. We need to consider amendments individu individually. They will be taken in order to which they appear in the compendium of the amendments. I remind you that the speech of the amendments are limited to one minute. Would you like to support amendment number one, Mr. Mrs. Luvuchi Kina? Dear colleagues, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, when assessing how different member states have reacted to the global pandemic, it is essential to take uh, into account the specific constitutional and legal order, as well as democratic environment in each country. And uh, this amendment uh, presents exactly this idea into the report. It was supported both by the rapporteur as well as unanimously in the uh, monitoring committee. So uh, please accept it and support it. Thank you. What's the opinion of the rapporteur, Mr. Lindel Gregan? Okay, sorry, I ask for, is anyone against? The opinion of the rapporteur, Mr. Lindel Wenger, please have the floor. I think, in basis, that there is no great problem. We can incorporate that into what we're doing. Thank you. We will now vote of this amendment. The vote is open.
okay, then I can close the vote and uh, we will now announce the result. Mr. President, 20 members voted in favor, no against, and two abstentions. There are still some members without voting rights who have participated in the vote. That's why their votes have been deducted from the result. 20 in favor, two abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who would like to support amendment number three? I ask Mrs. Uh, Bashkin. Спасибо. Коллеги, ограничивать законотворчество во время пандемии опасно, потому что принятие долговременных противоэпидемических мер возможно только изменением законов. Корректировка санитарных правил или финансовая поддержка или изменение налогов производится только законами. Долговременность действия – это признак большинства законов. Законы не делятся на долговременные и недолговременные. Кроме того, Проведение выборов в доэпидемической форме может усилить эпидемию, но сделать выборы безопасными можно также, изменяя законы. Законодательная работа в период эпидемии необходима. Напомню, что на заседании комиссии по политическим вопросам 23 сентября член российской делегации Слуцкий высказался о необходимости законодателя реагировать на пандемию. Докладчик с этим доводом согласился. И в заключение докладчик сказал, что он не слышал мое выступление. Я пользуюсь возможностью и счастливым случаем еще раз сказать, что я поблагодарил докладчика за этот доклад. Спасибо. Thank you. If amendment number three is adopted, amendment number four will fall. Is anyone wish to, to speak against? No. What's the opinion of the rapporteur? Um, thank you, and I'm I'm grateful my the Russian member come back, Mr. Bushkin. I must say that I don't think this needs to be in the report. I think the report is quite strong enough, and therefore I would ask colleagues to vote against this amendment because I feel the safeguards that my Russian colleague would like are already in the report. So I think we can safely say we do not need this re this re amendment at this stage. Thank you. We will now vote of this amendment. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I ask for the result to be displayed. Mr. President, the result is the following. One in favor, 20 against, and four abstentions. Thank you. Then who would like to support amendment number four? Mr. Baskin. Уважаемые коллеги, господин докладчик высказался против ужесточения фона общего текста и поэтому предложил отклонить поправку номер три. Вот поправка номер четыре является компромиссом и как раз смягчает позиции. То есть она допускает проведение неких голоса законотворческие принятие законотворческих актов, а в том числе и а кроме этого и голосование, проведение различных выборов, которые также необходимы для того, чтобы обеспечить нашу нормальную жизнь. Однако смягчает э, оговоркой при 
соблюдении различных безопасных мер. То есть за исключением случаев, когда обеспечено безопасное волеизъявление населения. И выборы и иные процедуры, связанные с голосованием, проводятся с учетом с принятием мер, которые исключают распространение пандемии. Просим поддержать поправку. Спасибо. Thank you. Anyone against? No. What's the opinion of the rapporteur? Sorry, the opinion of the rapporteur? Ah, yeah. Gillian from UK. just called me and uh, he says that he cannot uh, log in to speak if he is against the amendment. Okay. The rapporteur is not able to, to speak to us now, but, but just call us and say that uh, she, she's against. But then, then Gillan, then Gillan, okay, it's gone. Then, then Charles Gillan asked for the chair. Okay. The president of the committee. Yeah. Sorry, it was just to help say that the rapporteur is against yeah. and the committee is against. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the vote is open. And now close the road. And I ask for the result to be displayed. Mr. President, the result is the following. Two members voted in favor, 20 again, 21 against, and two abstentions. Thank you. The amendment is rejected. Who would like to support amendment number two? This is Luvok, China. During today's debate, many speakers uh, emphasized that one of the important functions of this assembly is uh, election observation. And clearly, with uh, everything that's happening uh, during pandemic, new ways of voting, restrictions to travel, we have to develop new approaches, uh, new modalities to uh, election assessment. And uh, this is exactly what this amendment suggests. Thank you and please support. Thank you. Anyone against? What is the opinion of the rapporteur? The rapporteur supports that, if that's helpful. Just, just a minute. Mrs. Gillian. Um, I understand the rapporteur supports the amendment, if that's helpful. We will now vote of this amendment. The vote is open. And the vote will be closer than 15 seconds. The vote is closed. And I ask for the result to be displayed. Mr. 
present are 22 in favor, no against, and uh, four abstentions. The amendment is uh, agreed to. And we will now proceed the vote to the draft resolution, Democracies Facing the COVID-19 pan Pandemic, document uh, 151057 is amended. To be adopted, a simply majority is required. The vote is open. The vote is closed and I ask for the result to be displayed. 24 members voted in favour and the two abstentions. And the draft resolution 15157 is adopted. The Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy has presented a draft recommendation Demo Demo democracies facing the COVID-19 pandemic, to which no amendment has been tabled. We shall now proceed to vote on the draft recommendation contained in document 15157 to be adopted. A two-thirds majority is required. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I ask for the result to be displayed. Twenty-six members voted in favour, no one against, and two abstentions. The draft recommendation in document 15157 is adopted. The Committee on Legal Affairs and Democracy have presented a draft resolution on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights and the rule of law, document 15139, to which two amendments have been tabled. We need to consider amendments individually. They will be taken in the order to which they appear in the compendium of amendments. I remind you that speeches on amendments are, limit, are limited to one minute. Who would like to support amendment number one? Mr. Sonic. Mr. Sonic, please, you have the floor. Oui. Alors, amendement A, euh, première, dans le paragraphe 3 du projet de résolution, avant le membre de phrase qui commence par le mot « le journaliste, le teneur d'alerte et le défenseur des droits de l'homme », insérer les propositions suivantes. Par conséquent, la pandémie de Covid-19 et d'autres crises similaires potentielles qui pourraient survenir à l'avenir ne devraient pas être considérées comme un prétexte pour l'adoption d'une législation d'urgence introduisant des restrictions à la liberté d'information qui vont au-delà de ce qui est légal, nécessaire, proportionné et non discriminatoire. Thank you. Is anyone against? What's the opinion of, of the community of the rapporteurs? Mr. Baranyan, please. Uh, I would like to congratulate and uh, express the words of gratitude to the Minister Sonic for this amendment. I am very much in favor of this amendment because it has a, a very uh, preventary, uh, in essence, in the future crises, this situation may be used as a pretext. Uh, I don't want to mention the names of the countries, but uh, I think that it's quite important to mention that this kind of legislation shouldn't be, uh, this kind of crisis shouldn't be used as a pretext for uh, limiting of the human rights. 
in this way. So I am in favor. Thank you, Mr. Valanyan. The vote is open. Okay, the vote is closed. I will ask for the result to be displayed. The 23 members who voted in favor, two against, and two abstentions. Thank you. Uh, so the amendment is adopted. We shall now proceed to vote on the draft resolution The Impact of the COVID 19 Pandemic on Human Rights. Oh, sorry. Okay. Now, sorry, uh, now who is like to support amendment number two? Mr. Sonic. Yeah, Mr. Sonic, please, you have the floor. Oui. Alors. Oui, je peux. Euh, oui, c'est le amendement euh, après le sous-paragraphe 12 5. Je propose deux sous-paragraphes suivants. 12 6. Euh, remplir leur obligation positive de protéger la liberté des médias et la sécurité des journalistes en utilisant tous les moyens nécessaires pour mettre fin aux attaques physiques et verbales contre les professionnels des médias. Et 12, 7, mettre fin à la pratique du blocage de sites internet et de, de, de déclenchement de poursuites pénales pour intimider et faire taire les critiques sous prétexte de lutter contre la désinformation. Deuxième amendement que je propose. Thank you, Mr. Sonic. Anyone against? Now, what's the opinion of the Committee of Reporters? Uh, this is quite important for the countries, members of the Council of Europe, to respect the rights and safety of the journalists. And that's why uh, I'm very present for uh, these amendments and addressing to the issue of the second amendment, 12.7, uh, the practice of blocking websites. I do believe that this is also a very important amendment because First, this is improportionate and uh, it's useless because in the digital era it is impossible just by blocking websites to control the internet. So I am very much in favor of these amendments. Thank you, Mr. Varanyan. We will now vote of, on this amendment. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I will ask for the result to be displayed. The 21 members who voted in favor, one against, and one abstention, Mr. President. 
Thank you. The amendment is agreed to. We shall now proceed to vote on the draft resolution, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights and the rule of law, document 15139 as amendment. To be adopted, a simple majority is required. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I ask for the results to be displayed. Mr. So, President, there are 30 members who voted in favor, no one against, and two abstentions. The draft resolution in document 15139 is adopted. The Committee on Legal Affairs and Democracy has presented a draft recommendation the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights and the rule of law. Document 15.139, to which no amendment has been tabled. To be adopted, a two-thirds majority is required. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I ask for the results to be displayed. Mr. President, there are 27 members who voted in favor, no one against, and two abstentions. The draft recommendation 15139 is adopted. Thank you. This will be the end of the sitting. Thank you. Next yeah. The standing committee, sorry, the standing committee will meet again at two thirty. Thank you.